You, you, you are now about to witness the strength of street knowledge. Let's discover hard couple months, but it's in this is enough for you to know what's up in the hood. Welcome to Hardcover News. My name is Janelli. And I'm Axel. Today's news report is about minorities uniting against police brutality. Many of you guys have heard of the Black Lives Matter movement, but some have been questioning that all lives matter. However, throughout the years, African American people have been discriminated and recently many cases have been made about the deaths of black people. Recently, 32-year-old Philando Castile was shot and killed by a cop when he was trying to take out his license just like he was asked. And with this family witnessing his murder, black lives are taken for granted and overlooked. How can all lives matter if there is still the killing of unarmed black people? M many minorities ask questions about their own race, questioning how the media only focuses on one race and Hispanics dying from police brutality in 2016. Throughout the years with many civil rights movements, minorities have come together with African Americans to fight for the injustices of our lives. Now let's go to Adam to see what the public thinks about this. We're on the 606 trail, and we're here to interview people. My name is Nasut Musa Kafreye. I'm a student teacher at a master teacher, partner Bab Yanun, a.k.a. Dr. Malakazi York. Yes. Because I'm a part of one. Uh, I'm a Nuwapian. Wunuwupu. Um, I know of identity groups that work toward ending like that type of systemic oppression. Um, I don't know of organizations that mix the two, but they stand in solidarity. Um, actually, in my school, there is there's actually a group called Five Plus One, which brings uh, Latinos together to fight um, off immigration or anybody like police going through. Um, police knocking on doors and saying, oh, you can't, you can't be here. Because we're not minorities, and as long as we let white people tell us we're minorities, we're going to continue to be killed because it is based on a media that we have no control over. We've never had control over the media in this country. We have to remember that America is a racist society that's built off the eradication and the enslavement of people of color. So we can never be surprised. <laughs> when the media is in their favor. We gotta wake up to that. Because they really don't focus on us, basically. I think it would make a change because uh, Latinos and African Americans are a big community, especially around here. And if we come together as one, it'll, we'll, we'll probably make a change. I think solidarity really important. I think solidarity is definitely going to help us move forward. The power of one voice is so much, and the power of many, many voices is going to be even greater. And so two different groups, two oppressed groups come together in solidarity with one another struggle. Uh, unarming the police, demilitarizing them. They, they, they move like military. They don't move like police. Black people are not, nor will we ever be considered United States citizens. We have to remember that. We are considered three-fifths of a human being chattel property. Native Americans are also qualified, classified, and identified as Negro colored and black, which is why the, the race tension between blacks and Latinos is actually frivolous because we the same people. Even Columbus recorded that in his log in 1654 when he first touched the shores of North America. So that's a historically documented fact. I would hope to see changes because the uh, police, um, police and the, uh, also the community are just turning on each other and it's making everything worse on us and them because they don't really help us out and we don't want their help because we're too ignorant to accept it. If the public consistently demonizes people of color, like the darker your skin is, the more they're going to villainize you. 
now that we got people's opinion, let's move on to Jocelyn. Thank you, Adam. There have been many deaths of minorities with 230 blacks and Hispanics, people dying due to police brutality. Through a study in Harvard University, police are 50% more likely to use force on Hispanics and blacks than white. We all need to question why that's happening. Whether it's due to stereotypes or racial profiling, it needs to come to an end. Welcome back to the studio. What we have gathered about people's responses in Johnson's and statistics is that instead of making separate movements for Hispanics and African Americans, we need to come together and help our neighbor. I totally agree with you, but unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Remember, we can all change the world together. We'll see you next time in Hardcover News. Hello, I'm Alejandro. And I'm Lolito. And today we will be discussing the heated debate over whether gentrification within Humboldt Park and Logan Square has improved or destroyed the neighborhood. But you may be asking, what is gentrification? Gentrification is a general term for the arrival of wealthier people in an existing urban district, a related increase in rents and property values, and changes in the district's character and culture. The term is often used negatively, suggesting the displacement of poor communities by rich outsiders. Gentrification it has its pros and cons. The gentrific gentrification of a neighborhood can raise values of property, increase the outward appeal, reduce crime rates, and attract middle class and affluent people outside of the city into the mentioned neighborhoods. Some downsides include the stripping of prior culture for residents who have made a home out of the community, long-term residents having to move into new areas due to the rise of rent, and higher pricing for establishments that have been long-time residents of the community. I'm Bianca Dodson and I live in the Humble Park area. Um, my opinion in the Humble Park area is that it's crazy how it changed over the years. Now there are so many new um, places like condos and things are being built around our neighborhood and changing our neighborhood and it's affecting me because it's raising our rent up and you know it's it's hard to see people that I know move out of the neighborhood because of how high their rent is. So I think that this should stop. <laughs> I think gentrification is good in doses. Um, 606 is kind of that point where any more is going to kind of ruin the culture the neighborhood has if there is any left. Um, but you know, that's the city's agenda. Some believe that it has Velasquez improved the community and making it safer and appealing to every Chicagoan. Luckily, um, the Bloomingdale Arts Building in which I live, it was a city-funded project and we have a grant to live there. And uh, what is it? Property tax is set at the rate in which we bought the place at. So, because we can still only sell it at the price we have it, we got it at. Um, so, I don't have that issue, but I know a lot of people in the neighborhood do. And I know uh, this year the property tax was raised significantly and a lot of people had to move out this year. Another community that has suffered the same effects of gentrification is Humble Park's neighboring residency of Logan Square. Recently, the Logan Square State, State Savings Bank on Logan and Milwaukee has been put up for sale. The sales price is between somewhere of two to three million dollars. This historic building is one sale away from being redeveloped and potentially being turned into condos, furthering the gentrification of the Logan Square area. Next to the California Blue Line train stop, a 12-story building is planned to be built. And even though the building will include low cost, some low-cost housing, the majority of the building will consist of one-room studio apartments with $1,500 rent, nearly double the average rent prices in Logan Square as of 2013. Honestly, I would do what Humble Park has done. Uh, even hu what Humble Park has done is not even that effective, but what Humble Park has done, they have a committee that regulates all of these things. They have people who speak on behalf of the people, and people who've lived there for generations, and I think that's honestly what any neighborhood in Chicago should do, because the only effective one I've ever seen to any degree is Humble Park's.
But the bottom line is, is that in Logan Square, rents are rising, the ethnic mix is changing due to the shrinking of affordable housing, and it is a rapidly gentrifying neighborhood. Now back to the studio. Overall, gentrification has its pros and cons. Some believe that it has vastly improved the community, making it safer and appealing to everyday Chicagoans. On the other side, <clears throat> people believe that they have been kicked out of their homes and the community has been stripped of its prior culture in replace of what new residents consider to be a higher form of living. Now it is up to the local residents to voice their opinions on gentrification in order to find common ground on the topic. This has been Hardcover News. Thank you for watching. community college versus a university. So they're the same thing, right? Same education. Ariana, but what exactly is a community college? Nice question, Leslie. A community college is a non-residential junior college offering courses to people living in a particular area. But well, Leslie, why did you say versus a university? What exactly is a university? A university is an institution of the highest level of education. Nice. See, a lot of people have the conflict of deciding whether a community college is better or a university. What do you think? Honestly, I think they're equally the same as far as education. The only big difference to me is the environment and the tuition fees. Right. One is way more than the other. Yeah, I think you, you guys already know the answer to that one. Um, how about we hear about what other people think? Yeah, good idea. The policies of a university seem to be more strict. There are a lot more students at universities compared to colleges. And I don't think that they have a handle on their students and they can't really know everybody's individual problems. Um, I think that university life can be or can offer as good as education as a college campus could. Um, it's just a different atmosphere and you grow in different ways. A university to me gives you a full-on experience so you kind of come into the person who you are as an adult and having that social experience and being out on your own uh, matures you as a person. The university I, attend, I attended didn't identify me as a person. I was more like a number. Mm -hmm. um, the college that I attended, Columbia College, absolutely identified me as a person. I knew just about every faculty and staff member um, in my major. For my preference, I would choose to go to a community college since I'm going to be able to probably speak more with my professor one-on-one. -on -one compared to having to speak, try to speak with them on the schedule with, in, within a university where it's more crowded. I feel a university education would be more advanced compared to a community since majority of community colleges only focus on associate's degree. I feel with the way the economy is now, people would probably just try striving more towards community college unless they're given a full ride scholarship, um, any form of money to attend university, but when it comes to the economy right now, I feel community colleges would be the safe route to go since it's not that much of a pay compared to universities. Many people may have not heard of Obama's two-year free plan, America's College Promise. Leslie, can you say about the promise? America's College Promise is a two-free community college plan for students, not only recent high school students, but non-traditional students. The students have to maintain a 2.5 GPA, and Obama only requires the students to attend part-time. Nice, Leslie. Thanks. Well, how would Obama go about his budget? Obama has not yet announced how he will be funding this plan, this proposed plan that has not yet been accepted by Congress, 
but he will be announcing that in the 2016 budget proposal. I don't think the America's College Promise proposal will help more people want to aim higher for higher education because we see now that higher education doesn't necessarily mean a better job and more money. A lot of college graduates are struggling. Um, I have a lot of friends who have a hard time getting good jobs and they have master's degrees and they're going in <laughs> back to school and getting in more debt and having a harder time getting a better job. I feel that the American College Promise will probably give people the motive that are just getting out of high school to maybe pursue going to educate like a community college, get an associate, and then maybe get a full ride scholarship towards a university when they feel they're giving help to get an education. You heard it from us. Thank you for watching Hardcover News. Let's think back not too long ago when your parents, family member, or elderly person told you not to act that way, dress that way, or maybe not talk that way. Remember that older kid who thought he or she is mature because of their age and they believe that they can talk down at you? When not too long ago, your parents were having the same spiel from their parents and older siblings, which led to a cycle of bad judgment. So we ask you this, is there a difference between generations? What I perceive generations to be, of course, in itself is the time difference. You know, there's, I, I would think a generation difference is between 20 years. Um, but what people need to know is that it's much more detailed than that. There is moral, you know, ideologies or political ideologies, philosophical and religious. Um, so there's a lot of factors that can be compared in between generations. And I believe it's might, it might be one of our most defining, you know, troubles in, in society. Because it, it makes us, you know, you know, fight over silly things or, or complicated things too, but we can learn from each other. The level of disrespect that's going on with this generation that did not go on and during the last generation, especially during my mother's, uh, one, for say, respect towards our elders. These, honestly, these kids of this era don't care. It's all about them. They feel this is their world and they can do whatever they please and that's not the case. It depends on how the world changes around you. It, like, I'm, every decade or so we have different influence, like with music and everything. People are influenced by different things. So that influence can affect generations to generations. Like, for example, we didn't grow up in a, most of us didn't grow up in a generation where people were segregated because of their race but there still are people out here that were. I don't think age really matters in maturity because I've met 20-year-olds um, that act like five-year-olds. I've met 16-year-olds um, that um, act like they're grown adults paying taxes. Different for each person. I, I've met I've, I've friends who are 18 or 19 or 22 and, you know, very mature. They, they approach the world with you know, a lot of responsibility. Um, but I also have, have friends who don't look at life that way. I really see maturity as a way of looking on life. I do not believe that age matters in maturity at all. Um, I say so because you can meet an older person that doesn't act their age and a younger person that acts way too mature. I mean, maturity and different levels, it all depends on the personality of the person. A person should present themselves um, a certain way in a picture, depending on what the picture is for. If it's like a profile picture for a modeling agency, I guess it should be um, presentable, not trashy. Um, if it's um, like a family portrait, kind of like a group picture. I mean, you can be silly, you can just have it kind of like a Christmas card, I guess. It depends on what you're doing. Um, but always, if you're doing something professional, make sure it looks professional, not, you know, this is something I just did in, like, my car. 
not half naked going on for the girls party because some girls be half naked and they take self and they take selfies i mean we have the freedom of expression and freedom of speech and you know we we can present ourselves any way we want we can't just fall into this norm of, of society, you know, to smile and to look happy because a lot of us are not happy or a lot of us don't want to express ourselves that way. So the way that they they dress more comfortably than they did a long time ago, I think. We all have different styles. Uh, so I guess it depends on what's available to you like i guess some some women will probably walk up down the street like a hoochie mama you know but it, it's the way that they want to present themselves when it comes to um young adults dressing i think think that um we dress for whatever on the whatever the new thing is like i have yet to see somebody um in last generation um dress in a 420 short or have like a giant hemp plant on it and I've yet to see somebody in this generation wearing parachute pants or something like that. At the end of the day, this is a growing time. Everything is just changing in a sense, I like to say evolving, but take note though, let's say twerking. It was brought to my attention not too long ago a lot of people, which I was, twerking came from African Americans in a sense. It was we turned up at the party. Yeah, twerking goes back years, years, years ago. It wasn't even brought to light till about this year and last year. What the thing is, though, people don't really know twerking. Everybody looked at for those who did not twerk. People looked at it as, oh, that's disgusting. That's ratchet. Oh, oh, she got no class. You know, whatever. But as soon as a skinny white girl by the name of Miley Cyrus with no booty at all gets to twerking on the stage, it was pandemonium all across the world, all through social media. For the longest, everybody was making twerk videos. White girls, black girls, Hispanic girls, Arabian girls. People used to dance and it used to be fun for everybody. But nowadays, all that, how people dance and how people uh, present themselves when they dance, it, it's not like something everybody likes. But back then, like, it was something everybody enjoyed, though. The, you know, like, what, the tap dancing and everything, it's just something that everybody could enjoy and sit down and watch. But now, pe people look, you see, I mean, people shaking their butts and stuff, but in a, in a, in a way, where it's not it's not something you would want to like watch in certain matters of course i mean that you can say that for every generation um i wouldn't say that we've been treated unfairly no absolutely not if anything we've been given so many gifts in our in our in our generation i mean like we have the expansion of the digital age and we have technology, we have computers and we have all these amazing things. And that's not to say that other generations had technology as well. I just feel like we're more interconnected. So we're more privileged. Um, and I think one of the main problems of why people may think we are mistreated is that other generations are jealous and they're like, well, you don't know what you have and you're not grateful. And I don't think it's a matter of being grateful. We shouldn't have to be grateful that we have all this technology. I mean, in the future, our children are going to have even greater technology. So it's not fair to say or not fair to, to use against us because we can use that against our generation as well. Like our grandparents, you know, started with the radio and their grandparents didn't have the radio, you know. So it's, it's really an unfair situation. However, we should be open minded and not be enough and not fall into the susceptibility of, of you know, of uh, insulting them back. We were babied a lot. I guess we were just coddled um, into thinking a certain way and everything started getting easier with my generation. Just, you know, the technology started getting more advanced. A lot of the stuff that everyone had to do back when my parents were young, you know, they didn't, I didn't have to deal with. Like for one, I work at the bank. I don't have to do a lot of the things manually. Naturally. I mean, one thing, again, I'm always going to be very careful because it's different context. But taking my family, there's a lot more freedom, but I don't know 
it's, people have different perceptions of what freedom means, but at least I mean, freedom of thought, for example. Um, I've been very lucky and not having been opposed, imposed upon by my parents, you know, I should think this, I should believe in God, I should this or that. I had the choice to decide these matters and not everyone, not the majority of people nowadays, my generation, have that choice still. But I feel like there is a movement towards that. But again, with every kind of progress in that regard, there's also regression. And you see it today, I mean, how polarized the US, how, how many children still grow up in a, you know, a very close society, being forced to believe this or that. Everyone is given their own piece of judgment. That's because everyone has their own opinions. But opinions are not fact. Be yourself. To those who believe that we should give up, think again. We've shown you that no matter when you are born, you are born in judgment, but no one is ever satisfied. No one is ever satisfied with who you are, what you do, or what you will do, but that does not mean you are any less of a person than anyone else.